Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, another week, another book review. Well, or rather, another fortnight, another book review is a better way of putting it. And this week, I'm taking a look at another more recent title, The Quantum Thief by Hanu Rajanimi, I guess. He's Swedish. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Sorry, Hanu, or however else you pronounce it. Feel free to post a comment saying how phonetically your name is pronounced. Now this book is fairly recent, so I'm not going to go too much into spoilers on this. Long story short, this is a book that, honestly, I would have liked to have seen nominated for a Hugo Award last year. What this is, is this is a transhumanist heist novel, or possibly a transhumanist post-scarcity heist novel. The main character of the, of the book, Jean Le Flambre, French, stupid European name pronunciations, anyway, he is a thief who is currently imprisoned in this sort of, I guess you'd call it interdimensional, not interdimensional, but like super science prison called the Dilemma Prison. It's basically you're getting put, he's being put through various logical puzzles, that sort of thing. It's almost, but not quite, like living your entire life, or living your entire sentence going through the prisoner's dilemma puzzle over and over and over again. And so, in this prison, he is b broken out, and he is basically given a job to steal something. There's not really clear what it is, because this book is based more around what he has to steal to prepare for this first job. It's the main job is going to be in the next book. And in this case, the book he, what he's trying to steal is his own memories. He has them hidden on Mars. He has to find them, get them back, and to a certain extent also figure out why he hid them. And this makes for a really, really interesting story. I like the idea of the post... I mean, there's the whole idea of a sort of post-scarcity heist novel. For those who aren't familiar, the idea of a post-scarcity society is one where, ultimately, the material goods aren't necessarily scarce. I, it, a good example of this is Star Trek. Frankly, Star Trek The Next Generation. In Star Trek The Next Generation, someone can go up to a replicator and say, I want a Coleman watch, like this one, and... It will materialize one, it will assemble it at the atomic level and provide it to you. And thus, at this point, the for a society, what is more valued in terms of goods is less related to, like, material stuff. Like, for example, my metal fountain pen is not more expensive because it's metal. It's... It's more expensive because of the handiwork in terms of something that's clear. Like, if the little, you can't really see this because it's not a focus, but the little lines on the um, clip for where it goes into your uh, shirt pocket, if those were done by hand, or a really clever design, or intricate f craftsmanship on the. Um, quill it on the uh, nub, that sort of thing would make something more valuable in a post-scarcity society. It's about craftsmanship, because ultimately, when all said and done, well, if you can assemble stuff at the molecular level, then plastic is cheap. A well-crafted mold that plastic is put into is worth more. And that, that, that's the general, general, sort of general idea behind a post-scarcity society. And those the goods that are, that are worth stealing are ideas. Actually, um, to a certain extent, while the society of um, inception is not itself post-scarcity, 
the idea of going into somebody's dreams or going some subconscious to steal an idea or implant an idea fits in with that post-scarcity sort of heist concept. Um, but also there's stuff as well in terms of stealing a well-crafted, one-of-a-kind, pe handmade piece of jewelry or that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, so I like this concept. In this particular, in this case, stealing mem stealing memories, particularly your own memories, which you've hidden someplace. All of that is very well done, well implemented, and all of the world building around Mars in this setting and how Mars is put together as a society is well done. It's kind of difficult to explain because it takes a long time to put all the pieces together in the book. And the reason why everything is the way it is on in Mars almost kind of makes sense in the sense of, as far as for nothing created by a by human being is necessarily totally logical in the way it works, but there is a certain underlying current of logic to this. Um, for a society where sort of memories and subconscious work the way they do. It's it's interesting, it's fascinating, and it, it's really hard to explain. Like the civilization like the society uses time as currency, like in, in time, but whereas in, in, in the movie In Time, when you run out of when you've spent all of your time you you die. Um instead what happens is you earn time by living as a quiet, um, because this is a, this is a post singular society, and basically you are just a body going and doing stuff, and you don't really have your 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 consciousness is in your head, but it's not really able to express itself in any way. It is it is in its own way slightly disturbing in that I have no mouth, but I must scream sort of sense. But once you have done your time as a quiet and earned up a bank of time, you then can become a person and express yourself. And you have your person, and you can do artwork, and you can buy and sell stuff using the time that you have allocated, that you have earned by living as a quiet. And then once you have spent all that time, you go back into being a quiet again. This is a post singularity society, and Thus, lifespans aren't necessarily a thing. Um, now, you can still be killed, but it's again, it's not as big of a thing as necessarily. They they don't go too much into how death works in the setting. I mean, death is a thing that can happen, but they don't go into explaining how it relates into this little world they build. Um, there are some characters who are killed, but they're stated that this is kind of something of a setback. They will be sort of recreated. These, these characters who are killed are from off planet, and they'll just be recreated with a new body, but they won't remember a certain amount of time after their death, or, or rather up to their death, um, just from their last backup. Whereas another person on Mars is killed, who's a, who's a local, and he's dead, dead for good. So that is interesting there, how that's handled. Um, the next book's going to be apparently going to be set entirely on Earth. I've, the sample chapter, chapter is out. And I'm interested in seeing what's going to happen in there. Um, honestly, this is a great book, actually. Um, as I've said before, this really should have been nominated for the Hugo Award of last year. It is a wonderfully written piece of work. I like heist stories in general, and I like how they apply the concept of the heist novel to a, well, post-scarcity transhumanist society where normally you'd say stealing stuff isn't a big thing. So, I like this. This is well done. Um, I definitely would recommend people read this and check it out. And there's time to spare. Now, I'm not going to do more Hugo stuff this week, because this weekend I saw the Avengers. And I enjoyed this a lot. Um, I've basically, leading up to this, I watched the last two of the Marvel movies that I hadn't seen before to finish building up the film. I watched The Incredible Hulk and 
Thor. And so I've got so I came into this with the full Marvel movie picture built up. And so I knew who everyone was coming into this. I knew who Loki was. And I enjoyed this movie immensely. This is honestly the best superhero movie of all time. It's better than Superman 2. It is, I say it's about as good, I say it's, it, it is better than, um, the Dark, than the Dark Knight. I would say it's also better than Watchmen. Though, to be fair, the Dark Knight and Watchmen are very different animals in comparison to this. Watchmen and the, I mean, Watchmen is the film that, or the comic that combined with the Dark Knight Returns kicked comics, ki um, screaming into the Iron Age slash Dark Age of comics and leading to the numerous pieces of grim dark like Young Blood and Spawn and all the other stuff that came afterwards, some of which were good at certain degrees, some of which were pretty, pretty bad. Young Blood, um, oh god, basically just the whole Young Blood Liefeld verse, for example. And those are grim, those are dark, those are serious. There is not a lot of humor and levity to them. I mean, there's not many points in the Dark Knight where you laugh because something is really funny, not be in a sort of comedic sense, not because of a darkly comic sense like "Watch me make this pencil disappear." Wow, <laughs> not like that. Whereas for the Avengers. This is ultimately a Joss Whedon film. It takes cues from the Ultimates universe, and it takes all these pieces from the other movies that came before, but this is a Joss Whedon film. Joss likes his heroes heroic. He also likes his heroes flawed, but they're, her but they're heroically flawed. They do the right thing when the chips are down, but maybe in their personal life they make mistakes. I believe that Joss is the one who did the whole, who partially came up with the whole Emma Frost and Cyclops cheat on, cheat on Jean Grey psychically thing. I think that was Joss Whedon who came up with that. I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that. Um, but the humor in this is very well done. The banter is good for all the characters. It helps that I, I strongly suspect that Robert Downey Jr. did a fair amount of improv with um, Tony Stark character, but that's kind of what you do. Is Robert Downey Jr. already is kind of playing the type of character who Joss would be right want to write anyway, except kicked up a few notches higher. So I have no problem with Joss kind of pointing Robert Downey Jr. in a narrative direction and saying "go," and letting. Say, for example, Robert Downey Jr. improv, improv lines like, and I like the way you turn into a big green rage monster. That sort of thing. It's not a spoiler, it's in the trailer. Um, all the other good stuff. So, right, so, narratively and character wise, this film is very well done. And their story is well paced. It does a good job of letting, well, giving the audience a chance to catch its breath. And when we're catching the breath, gives a chance to chuckle and that sort of, and with all the humor and witty banter between the characters, and then after we've had a chance to catch our breath, if we had a chance to laugh a bit, we get fight scenes, fight scenes that are well done. There is no shaky cam. There is no camera that's too far zoomed in. We see everything, which is honestly, when you're doing a comic book superhero movie, is what you need to see. We have action that is well put together, has tension to it, even if we know that, oh, these characters aren't going to die yet because the movie isn't over. And it's put together well because... And honestly, Joss is working comics. He doesn't do art in comics, but he is writing. And so he he knows... But, but he, He's a very good visual director. Lots of people like to think of Joss Whedon as... The writing director, as a well, as a writing director, he writes witty dialogue. They think of Buffy, they think of Angel, they think of Firefly, they think of all the little bits and pieces in those 
in those television series with all the little quotable snippets from the characters. But if you look at Joss's stuff, he also does action very well. His fight scenes are dynamic, but followable. He is good at building a sense of um, place for where the fights are going on and where the geography is from different portions of a fight. He does a good job of building visual tension. There was that good classic shot from the end of Angel where we see the just the shadows of the creatures that are coming down the alley without seeing the creatures. And so, I mean, on the one hand, this saves Joss some budget money in terms of having to create the monsters and put people in suits or anything like that for the final episode. But on the other hand, it gives the audience enough to draw an impression and let us figure things out ourselves. And all this other sorts of really great stuff. So, ultimately, Joss is probably one of the best people to do this. And actually, I would like it if more directors took cues from Joss Whedon on this in terms of the visual way he puts his action sequences together. Instead of going the Michael Bay, shaky cam, can't see anything um, route, or, or like that, or, or your born identity, same sort of thing, I like it when films let you see what is going on in your action sequences. I mean, it works. It helps build tension. It helps build audience investment. The only time where I've seen, like, having a fight scene not out so that you can see everything and have it work is some of the Hong Kong stuff from like the 60s and 70s where it would stay on the wide shot and you'd see the whole fight scene and then occasionally would zoom in for a particular thing like when in Enter the Dragon where um, Bruce Lee's character snapped um, snapped O'Hara's neck with his feet because it's we, we don't see the next nap, we are zoomed in on Bruce Lee's character's face and we hear it. We see the look on his face. And that tells us, it gives us the emotional content, calling back to something that Bruce Lee said earlier in that movie, for that action. So, that's what I like about Joss Whedon's direction on this. Um, I'm kind of bouncing around a bit because you know, I'm trying to avoid spoilers. I don't want to talk about specific moments too much if they're not something that's in the trailer. Other than that, I mean, Tom Hiddleston, I believe I can pronounce his name, is excellent as Loki. He did a really good job in Thor as well, but I mean, he's being directed by Kenneth Branagh, and Kenneth Branagh didn't get a good performance out of a bucket of water. So, hey. Actually, I would say of all the movies that do, of all the Marvel movies, probably the ones you need to see the most out of all of these would be Thor and Iron Man if you're coming into this. Thor, because Loki plays a big role in this, and you need that build up on Loki. Captain America is also kind of worth seeing as well. And seeing all of them is good. It gives you, all of them do the origins for their respective characters in some degree or another, and it gives you emotional build-up for those characters, character development for them, and so that, for a certain extent, when the movie comes around, we can focus away from developing each of these individual characters on their own and focus more on building them together as a cohesive whole of a team. To borrow a sort of phrase from my textbooks, from some of the classes I've taken this term on um, small group psychology and business psychology and that sort of thing, this film basically is a team going through the phases of forming, storming, norming, and performing. Um, stor in particular, basically the storming phase where everyone is bickering and fighting amongst themselves and trying to figure out where they are in the hierarchical pecking order and who's going to be leading and all this other sorts of stuff. And by the end of the film, they have gotten through all of that and they are at the performing stage and they are working together as a cohesive whole and it's great. Um, actually, the I would recommend if you are instructing a small group communications class in a community college or just any college in general, go watch this movie and make your class watch it and take notes. Because this is really a good example of that. 
The Avengers, of all the various super teams in the history of fiction, is perhaps the most dysfunctional, or because their roster rotates so much, and thus they go through these phases so often that they are a good reference for this, where you can read the Avengers comics, and as each individual lineup goes around, new lineup goes around, we see you see them go through the phases where you have. Um, the beast sitting on the ceiling and um, reading up while standing upside down, and people chewing him out for that. And you have um, other stuff. You have possibly like Ben Grimm as a guest member, and he's just just being well, Ben Grimm and gruff and kind of rude and that sort of thing. Or you have Wolverine, who is kind of violent and who smokes and who drinks beer. And you he's probably smoking indoors in the Avengers Mansion. They've been trying to get him no. Take that! Take your stinky cigars outside, and all those other sorts of little bickering, bantery stuff, uh, argumentative stuff, as the, the group comes to a cohesive whole. And once that, but once that's done, usually like about a year or two into the into the run, the team operates as a well-oiled machine. We start over from the beginning again next time that our writer decides. Nope, Beast is going back to the X Men. Um, and it's not going to be in the Avengers this time. Wolverine is going to go do his loner thing now and quit all of his teams. Um, we are going to swap out Iron Man with War Machine. Or uh, we're going to have Hank Pym leave and Scott Lang join as Ant-Man. Or all this other various sorts of stuff. And then we all begin again, unless it's a reforming of an older roster in a new situation. All this sorts of stuff. So, really, the story of the Avengers is what I'm trying to say is the story of the Avengers in comic and in particular in cinematic form is the story of a group of people learning to work together as a team and then eventually going their separate ways and coming back together again later. So, when all said and done, and after I finished rambling back and forth and up and down again, The Avengers is an excellent movie. You should go see it. If you haven't seen it already, if you weren't part of the world record-setting $200 million opening weekend U.S. gross, or if, you haven't, or if you're international and you've seen it already, because you got to see it a week early, go see it again. If you're a small group communications instructor, go see it particularly. Take notes after the film. And maybe give this, give this film as extra credit homework. Particularly since Memorial Day weekend's coming up, and if you're a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, you'll be missing one day that week, and you might as well give them a little extra time to work while they are. Um, just take advantage of that time, since you won't have that time in the classroom. So that's enough of that. Until next time, I will be. Actually, yeah, next time I will be taking a look at. Hmm. It's going to be a 50-50 toss-up here. I've I've beaten um, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, but I'm not sure if I want to do a, a Let's Play of that first before I do the actual game review. So I might do that. I also have a Need for Speed to Run, where I've basically got through it enough where I feel comfortable passing judgment on a racing game. So I might do that next week instead. So we'll see what I do. Until next time, thank you for watching.